All right, uh, most of you have seen a picture similar to this one where you have a, you know, the direct cost is what you see, but under that there is a lot of uh, uh, cost that's hidden. You have lost of time, uh, productivity, you know, people going around and see what happened. The supervisor now has to stop what they're doing. They can't supervise the work. They have to see what was the accident, damage to tools and equipment, you know. Uh, the productivity for the remainder of the day is pretty much gone because now everybody's talking about the accident and what happened and so forth. You know, you if, if the accident is uh, severe to affect your your schedule, then you may fail to provide your your final product on time. Then you have you know liquidated damages. It, it can get really really expensive. Um, when you look at the big picture of the accident and how much would that just cost you. Plus other uh, aspects that are very difficult to measure, uh, morale, human tragedy, the reputation of the company, now no one wants to work with you because you, you, know, you have a history of uh, accidents and expensive accidents. You know, uh, we talked about the cost of uh, sales to recover. Yeah, we talked mm -hmm. about that, right? I think we, we, we covered this uh, deal before. Uh, here is uh, examples of um, case studies from uh, stadium. So, you know, just not because the stadium have a particular uh, high level of uh, risk, but just because uh, it's a, a, a case where we can look at different stadiums that's being done and uh, see what happened. Here is a, a Miller Park Stadium when the uh, big blue uh, crane collapsed. They were moving this uh, huge structure and uh, the, the, the crane collapsed causing a lot of uh, destruction. Uh, it, it threw back the uh, schedule for completion quite a bit and uh, I think uh, some people died also in that, uh, in that accident. Uh, delayed of the opening for one year, $100 million in repairs, so that, that kind of uh, expensive. Three construction workers killed, several other injuries, you know, that, that was a, a huge accident. I have a video of that uh, accident somewhere in, in, in my uh, I forgot, what were the punitive damages? I think they did something that... Like, huh? No, 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 no. Why they played the uh, punitive damages? I think I think they, there was something recurring on there or something that I forgot. Yeah. I'm not sure. Uh, uh, well, there it says that the punitive damages are still under appeal. Oh, yeah. Well, no, no. They might, they're going to be under appeal for the next... Mm -hmm. 200 years. years. Yeah, sure. <laughs> that, that amount? Shit. That amount or... Keep on feeling. Uh, remember, punitive damages are going to probably pay by the insurance, so... <laughs> yeah. 94 million is a lot of money. Yeah. It is. So, so that, that's a case. And someone in, in one of my classes that we were talking about this case, uh, I, I don't know really the story behind it, but it looks like uh, the operator of the crane said that he felt it was not safe to do that operation. That was wind or something. So then the, the superintendent said, okay, move. We'll bring somebody else, we'll do it. The guy in training said it was not safe to do it. So they moved him and then finally got some media right. that said, yeah, 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 I can move that thing. And boom. Yeah. And uh, the guys that died were the guys on the, uh, on the basket. Yeah. I don't remember. Yeah. yeah that's yeah, the, the guys that were going to guy. do the connections. Yeah. It's, uh, let, let's see if we can find it uh, real quick here. Uh, that was it. Yeah. The original operator was removed from the crane. Mm -hmm. uh, it's crane. You put crane. There it is. Yeah, yeah. This is water. That's the. This yeah, yeah. Uh, this there's crane a crashed during construction of the new Miller Park Stadium, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. 
July 14, 1999, and three men lose their lives. Coming down now. Okay. Hang on. We have to train our Yes, sir. Thanks, I'm gone. What the hell is this? What's going on here? Okay, watch it, watch it! Uh, the crane operator said you can hear the pin start to, to buckle. That's when he goes, I'm out of here. Yeah. Uh oh. Something's going wrong here. Yeah, he got yeah, out of the cab. Yeah. He knew it was yeah. going to go. He got out of there. There's nothing he can do to save it. He hurt his hand or something, but he got away. Oh my God. Hmm. So that uh, that's a case where where a disaster strikes and uh, you know the the, the project got really uh, delayed. Original budget three hundred twenty two million dollars. Final cost eight hundred fifty million dollars. Uh, hundred million dollars in repairs. You know twenty seven million dollars in uh, injury, and then uh, three hundred thirty million in interest in bonds. Litigation is ongoing with a hundred million dollars in claims still unresolved. Uh, so then uh, there's other stadium construction deaths: Rosemont, uh, Arizona, five uh, workers killed; Seattle, two workers killed; Olympic Stadium, Atlanta, one, work, one worker killed. Back one ballpark, Phillips Arena, you know, University of Florida in Gainesville. <clears throat> Not only in the U.S. but also internationally, we have uh, cases with uh, fatalities. Nineteen workers died in the um, Athens uh, construction. Now there are also cases of uh, stadiums that have been done uh, extremely well without uh, incidents. Uh, here's this uh, Paul Brown Stadium. You know, no. Uh, Injuries was a uh, significant saving program. These people had a partnership with OSHA, and uh, you know, was a, a good result. Here's another one: Great American Ballpark, Soldier Field. These are uh, stadiums that have been done well and uh, no issues. You know, and that what they say is, you know, that the safety procedures get them uh, good good results, and you know, for normally the project is done uh, on time uh, or before and within budget. The one I would like to have here is the you know the Miller Stadium. So I was wondering if you can get me some Miller data. Miller Stadium or Martins? The, I'm sorry, the Martins. The Martins. I'll send, yeah. you, I'll send you some, some photos, some areas. Yeah, some photos, some facts, you know, cost and injuries and stuff. And I think that that would be a really, really good uh, stadium to, to, to have here. Well, here we have a, a worker that fell from a um, uh, metal structure. He was tied, so that was not, uh, not a big issue. And then, you know, could have been a fatality, but... Uh, it, at the end, he was uh, lower down, safe. All right, so that, that shows uh, you know how a, a fatality or a big accident can impact the cost and the scale of a, a project. Now, uh, record keeping is another important aspect of uh, OSHA. We have talked about that uh, many times. We need to. Uh, report to OSHA whenever there is the a fatality or the um, 
hospitalization of three or more workers within uh, eight hours, and then we have to report any other uh, accidents that uh, result from injuries. So here is the uh, regulations about uh, reporting accidents to OSHA. Uh, all employers must report to OSHA any workplace incident that results in a fatality or the hospitalization of three or more, more employees. All injuries and illnesses should be recorded regardless of the severity if they result in anything, uh, in any of the following. Death, one or more uh, lost days, restriction of more or motion, uh, of motion of work, loss of consciousness, transfer to another job, uh, or medical treatment that goes uh, beyond first aid. Uh, okay, what's that? If I call an ambulance, is that first aid? Or is it, I mean, that's beyond first aid, yeah. So that, that should be uh, so recorded. Like having walk through, having people have walk through, they take it to the doctor's office, but you're, you're, after that, you just go home. That's, that, you don't report that. Yeah, uh, yeah. You can, if you go on OSHA website, yeah. look at recordable and non-recordable injuries, and typically the recordable ones are the ones that are not first aid. But first aid, it's real, yeah, it's, it's real tricky break. sometimes. Right. A struggle at the end of each year to figure out okay was it is it not because sometimes it gets very hairy so like anything that they can go in and um, let's say I twisted my ankle and I go in they run an x-ray to make sure people are like damn you run an x-ray it's got to be recordable but if the x-rays were negative it's not a recordable now if the x-rays were positive and you have a fracture then it's a recordable so that's not recordable if you need a tetanus shot that's not recordable Butterfly stitches, uh, they're a little bit on the fence about that. Typically, they're not. Real stitches are. Um, so you want to go on there and see what is and what's not. I mean, they have a whole, I have a book in my cards about that thick, about what's recordable and what's not. Um, so it gets pretty tricky. Okay. Typically, your clinics, if you use a clinic that is a occupational health clinic, mm -hmm. not just a walk-in or emergency clinic, if you choose an occupational health clinic like Concentra or... Physicians Health Centers, they are usually really versed in that and they want to help you keep your recordable injuries down. So, okay. for so instance, instead of saying, hey, I'm going to dispense you 600 milligrams of ibuprofen, you'll have some doctors that say, listen, go home and drink six Advils. That way it doesn't show up as a recordable on your, on your, on your injury log. So, some clinics are more employer friendly than others. Not to say that they're limiting the medical treatment. The guy's still drinking 600 milligrams of ibuprofen, it's but it's naming naming another, naming another play of the game. Euphemism for the 600. Another play of the game, right? Okay, interesting. Yeah, the, the, uh, as he said, in, in the OSHA regulations, if you go to the website, they have a uh, uh, um, chart that tells you, you know, how to determine if that particular illness is recordable, but this is maybe too simple, but you know, this is the way they, they have this. Did the employer experience an injury or illness? Yes. Is the injury or illness uh, work-related? It has to be work-related. It's not something that happened at home and, and then come in. Is the injury or illness a, a new case? If it is a new case, then um, you record it as such. If no, then you update your record uh, entry. Okay, so then uh, does the injury or illness meet the general recording criteria? Uh, if yes, then yes, record the injury. So then you gotta go back okay, and look uh, at something that happened there. Isn't, isn't oh, well, maybe it's just work from composition, not recording. But doesn't work from composition cover like 30 minutes before I'm out and then? Yeah, if you're driving, minutes, if it's 20, I think it's 20 miles from the work. From the work. From and the work back and job site because of commuting. It right. covers your commuting. You commute. If you if you're if you get in a car wreck 20 miles from the job site on the way or leaving work, yeah. then okay. you there's some it. there's some that do or some that don't. I think in the follow up class we had, that came up. That class we had in the afternoon, mm -hmm. that came up, and they were talking about. Actually, no, I'm sorry. I'm thinking about a seminar I was at. For instance, Physicians Health Center held a seminar talking about that. And one of the questions was, hey, if you're a um, if you're, uh, what are these guys that work in the jails for help? Oh, if you're a corrections officer and you're going to or from work, regardless of the mileage, 
you're covered under workers' comp. And everybody was like, why do they and we don't? It was them, it was police officers, and somebody else. Stress. And they basically said they just have a strong union. Oh. So the unions were able to negotiate that deal and, and put it in my, there. I had my guys but got some people do not. Got in a wreck and they did it was not covered. They tried right. to claim it. My insurance said no, they're not. The not difference covered. is that if you have a site here at FIU and they tell them, Hey, come to FIU to do work and now you tell them, Hey, I need you to go to Home Depot and get something, that's outside of the scope where they're driving to and from work. Now they get into an accident going to Home Depot, now they're gonna fall on into your workers' comp. Because many years ago and this was a friend of mine and uh, it was during lunchtime, and he used to go to his mother-in-law to eat every after every lunchtime. And one day, he uh, his car it was back then when you could drive from Nissan an hour from downtown Miami to Hialeah. Right. And uh, and his car overheated, and stupid him, he went and picked up, and he burned. But because it happened during lunchtime, he he was covered on the works no, no. at the time, mm -hmm. and he was on his personal car at the time. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, but it, but it, but it was during the eight hours mm -hmm. during his lunch time, even though and and it I mean it's uh... it's tough. It's a tough needle to thread. I mean you know big Fortune 500 company. They're like, listen, you don't have to leave the complex. We have a full fledged LA Fitness here. All right. So now what happens if they get injured doing weights? Right. Yeah. You know. So it's like, do we have it? Do we not? Is it more feasible to just have them leave the whole complex and then come back and have that happen mm -hmm. too long? Yeah. Um, yeah. This one. I mean. And then it's always a years ago. <laughs> yeah. so I, but you can imagine, and we're talking about people on the road, but I mean, construction but guys, that's, that's, 15 you know, minute break, the lunch truck comes at 9.30, 9 mm -hmm. o'clock. You don't know what they do for 15, 20 minutes. Let them go and sit in their car, get happy time, and then they come back, okay? And all yeah. of a sudden, they're a delight to work with for about two hours, you know? Yeah. Well, here's uh, uh, what the regulation says, uh, basic requirement, 1904.7. You must consider an injury or illness to meet the general recording criteria and therefore to be recordable if it, is re if it results in any of the following. Death, days away from work, restricted work or transfer to another job, medical treatment beyond first aid, that's uh, what, what the question was, or loss of consciousness. You must also consider a case to meet the general recording criteria if it involves a significant injury or illness diagnosed by a physician or other licensed healthcare professional, even if it does not result in death days away from work, restricted work or job transfer, medical treatment before beyond first aid or loss of consciousness. So I guess the, the, the issue here is, you know, what is medical treatment beyond first aid? That's what, what we'll uh, determine and, and that's where the book that you have says okay these are the cases that are not beyond first aid uh, right. that's human right good all right how quickly must uh, each injury or illness be recorded you must enter each recordable injury or illness on the OSHA 300 log and 301 incident report within seven calendar days of receiving information that a recordable injury or illness has occurred. Um, if a firm employs 11 or more employees at one time in the previous year, then uh, they must fill, file OSHA form 300 and 300A. 300 is the log of uh, related Just, injuries. Uh, really quick, I'm sorry, yeah. this, this came up during that um, seminar because you got to make sure that you keep two things completely separate. One thing is what OSHA deems recordable, and one thing is what falls under workers' compensation or not. And a lot of times people get that mixed up. So, okay. for instance, people see that well, firm for 11, they're like, why 11 employees? I thought you only, had, you only needed workers' comp if you have more than five. So people will get that very confused. So make sure when you get questions related to this, you know Work what they're referring to. Are referring they referring to OSHA recording or are they referring to workers' comp? Okay. Thank you. So you have these uh, forms, the 200, 200A, and 201. These are the OSHA forms related to injuries. So whenever you have a, an, an injury, you, you fill in the uh, 301. That's a specific case uh, of injury. Then that record goes into the summary, uh, form 300A. 
and that goes into the log of uh, injuries. So you, you don't need to, for, to, to, fill, to, to post the log, but you do have to post the summary. And that summary must be uh, placed on a, on, on a location that, had, uh, that is an ECB accessible to employees that can be seen. And it runs from February 1st, that covers a uh, previous year that ended in December, all the way until uh, April 30th uh, next year, right? Both the log and the summary should be retained on file for five years. Okay, so that's uh, the uh, recording uh, from the OSHA perspective. You need to have uh, the accident report investigation and uh, and and. and notification as part of your safety plan should be completed on a timely basis, you know. Uh, again, you should have your uh, photos uh, taken, uh, witnesses, you know, time lost. Make sure that you uh, comply with the OSHA requirements. I don't know, this seems to be repeated here again. Uh, I have to look into that. Employers must use uh, these OSHA 300, 301. Uh, I, I forgot that today I will have this uh, small uh, work case for groups, so I didn't bring the OSHA 300 forms. We'll do that next class. Uh, basically, I just bring in the, the forms and you guys uh, fill them in. Okay. So now, uh, the question here is, uh, how do we know that a safety and health program that we have implemented in, in our workplace, it's effective? So ways to do that is, you know, go and ask the employees, you know, are you aware that we have a safety plan? What is included in that safety plan? What do you do in case of an emergency? You know, that, that helps uh, evaluating the, the, the case. Ask people, you know, do they have a... a um, safety as a priority in this company. Uh, do you know what are the goals for this plan are? Do you know who is responsible for safety? That kind of things you can ask to the uh, employees and find out if the, the, the plan is effective. Ask uh, the subcontractors, you know, what is the policy for the company? You know, That kind of uh, questions will, will tell you if uh, the plan is effective or not. How to use the personal protective equipment? Do you know how, to, does employee know how to do that, how to check uh, for the uh, personal protective equipment to be in good operable conditions and so on. <coughs> Review the site conditions, you know, look at uh, how the, the procedures have been uh, taken how many uh, missed accidents occur? Do they do a hazard analysis or an after uh, analysis of the near miss accident? And um, that that's how you will determine if your uh, plan is effective or not. Now, um, I want to talk also a little bit about uh, quality because quality and safety sometimes go hand in hand in terms of uh, how do you analyze quality, what tools are people using to evaluate quality and, and safety, and sometimes they, they, they go together. Uh, I believe, you know, for a project to be successful, you need to have uh, a good control of the cost and time, obviously. You want to be you know, under budget, uh, you, have, you want to do your work on time, but also you need to provide a safe environment, uh, a job that has not uh, caused severe losses of life or, or injuries, and that it's of a high quality. So those, those are the uh, basic measurements of our effective, uh, successful project. So quality management brings uh, quality into the construction site. It uh, looks at the uh, aspect of uh, how do we do a work that is going to be satisfactory to the owner, 
you know you want to meet the customer expectations you want to exceed them and uh, there are several tools that are done uh, to to bring the quality of the work uh, to a high level one of those is to create uh, teams you know you, you create a team of people you ask you know how can we do this work better how can we have a better uh, outcome do a quality work you know commit to efficiency and that also goes hand in hand with uh, safety implement process of continuous improvement you know always trying to do things better more efficiently in this case also safer that will that will bring you know, the two aspects of uh, quality and safety in hand. Uh, similar to the safety plan, you can implement a quality plan that you, you know, you go and you, you have set up your goals, then you go on the side and start measuring the quality of the work that is being performed, the quality of the materials that you're receiving, the quality of the tools, and then perform uh, quality control, make sure that uh, the results that you're getting are according to the standards. One uh, diagram that is used in, in quality analysis is this uh, cost effect diagram or fishbone uh, diagram. Here we have the potential causes that can bring a defect on a product and then you know you can analyze each one of those see how much of an impact they have on this uh, defect but you can also do a fishbone analysis for safety, right? You have an accident. What are the different potential causes for that accident? Evaluate them and then uh, remove them from the, uh, from the work. Then you have uh, control charts. These are charts that are mostly used in uh, processes. So you have an average that you expect uh, to have uh, on the measurement of certain work. And then you have boundaries, upper and lower con control limit. If your production goes outside this limit, you know that something is wrong, so you have to stop the process. Similarly, you can use a graphic like that to uh, measure, you know, I don't know, uh, hours or, or uh, quality aspect of the construction site. Flow chart. Uh, you know, again, this is very similar to what we see, we saw before, the different uh, elements that need to be done, the sequence of operations, and, you know, which one of those can cost a, a low quality process, which one, you can ask the question also, which will bring a low quality uh, or low safety issue. Histograms are very uh, highly used in quality control where you have, you know, the repetitions of certain instances. You can have histograms for safety purposes, you know, injuries and in different types, lacerations, fractures, falls, whatever, and then keep a, a chart of uh, different type of accidents. The Pareto chart, it's an interesting chart because it's based on the concept that 80% uh, of the problems are caused by 20% of factors. So, in, uh, you know, if, if you look at that smaller group of uh, things that create a large number of problems, then you will be using your time uh, effectively. So you, you can also look at, you know, what are the most frequent causes of accidents and then apply the same type of uh, tools to, to maintain um, a safety environment. Uh, testing and inspection, it's also done uh, frequently for uh, quality purposes. You either have your own people or bring uh, third parties uh, into the project to verify that the quality that you're getting is uh, it's, it's, uh, correct. And we'll do this work in groups at another time. Questions or comments? Anything on your mind uh, about what we have uh, talked today? No? You guys had enough uh, for today? All right, very good. So that, that was uh, all they had uh, for today. Uh, I'll see you guys uh, next week.
please remember to check the calendar. Make sure, you know, if you are presenting. Next week we have uh, Michael, we have uh, Miguel Cruz, uh, Micah, and Jackie presenting. Uh, and, and again, uh, I would like the presentations to be sort of uh, on the on the short side, if you want, you know. I don't mind if, if you if you have something interesting, you want to stand a little bit longer, that's fine. I, I was looking into 10 to 15 minutes and, and trying to present something that supports the presentation that I'm doing, you know. Not, not so much as to repeat it, but as to support it with different angles or, you know, bring in pictures or things that are uh, interesting to you that you may want to share with the rest of the class. Yep. Well, one question I have, what should we expect for the exam? For the exam? Well, the exam is a uh, multiple selection. Multiple choice? Yeah, multiple choice. Uh, it's about, um, I don't know, the last time, last exam I made was about 75 questions. And uh, I have a form that you need to fill in. Uh, there are several forms in OSHA. You have accident report. You have a complaint. Uh, you have the whistleblower uh, um, act where you can, you know, tell OSHA about the safety issue in your workplace. There is um, complaints when you are um, unfairly treated after you report a, a accident or after you report a uh, safety or health issue. You know under the whistleblower act also. So one of those forms is going to show up on the exam. Uh, and, and then, you know, you just have to fill it out. That's the exam. So. It's based, uh, I would say, maybe 90% on the PowerPoint. And then there is another 10% that comes from the handouts that I have uh, posted. OK? Okay, guys, so I'll see you uh, next week then.